Welcome back, Eigen family. So good to see you guys once yes. again. Make sure you like, share, comment, subscribe uh, to the channel if you haven't already. Um, excuse me. <laughs> Make sure you uh, check out the website, eigenbros.com. Mm -hmm. Eigen Bros on Twitter, Eigen Bros on Instagram, Eigen Bros 2 on TikTok. And then, of course, patrons, thank you guys so much for your support. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. And if you guys would like to join our Patreon as well, check out patreon.com slash eigenbros. And we, get a, we give you a 30-minute podcast there every week, uh, exclusive audio podcast about random stuff. And, uh, yeah, that's it. Definitely an emphasis on random things, yeah. for sure. We, uh, <laughs> we, we don't really have topics on there. It's just free form, so feel free to join us on there. Um, and Discord, too. Discord chat is open, so you can come and talk to us yeah. whenever you feel like. Uh, post some irrelevant stuff, ask us questions, um, things like that. It's a lot of fun. We have a lot of fun there. And, uh, and yeah, go ahead and subscribe you can yeah. pay anything you want right pretty right, much right. is it is it like a free it's pretty much like pay whatever you want right yeah okay cool i say just at least a dollar please no, I'm just <laughs> save nah. an eigenbro today. yeah save an eigenbro <laughs> anyway uh, let's stop being uh beggars, uh, beggars on the street <laughs> yeah but yeah we're gonna try the new format now i want to say to the audience yeah. We gotta, we're going to try to keep it more discussing format instead of like yeah. uh, trying to teach you like kind of a lecture. Yeah. So, yeah, just uh, sit back and enjoy, Sit I guess. back and enjoy the conversation. <laughs> we're having a real live conversation yeah. about the topic. And today's topic is actually uh, kind of has to do a little bit with what we talked about in the previous episode. Yeah. Um, but it's dealing with uh, quantum... Uh, computers, quantum computers, quantum algorithms, mm -hmm. quantum everything. Yeah. So, <laughs> quantize everything. That should be a new slogan. That could go on a T-shirt. Uh, yeah. Think about it. Quantize everything. Ooh, merch idea. Merch idea. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or a mug. Quantize this. And what would be? What would it look like though? Quantize everything. Uh, merch. Actually, quantize this is actually funnier now that I think about it. Quantize this. <laughs> like, imagine, like, a shirt that has an arrow pointing <laughs> up or down, depending on your perspective. But whichever one, the funnier one is pointing down. Yeah. Quantize this. <laughs> it's like a uh, cat vector or something. Sure. I don't know. <laughs> but it's quantizing everything. Um, quantize everything. Yeah, quantize this. We really this. solidify our places, the bad boys of physics. <laughs> yeah, I really would. Uh, man, that would be so much fun, just making like irrelevant physics merch. Yeah, it would be fun. Yeah, it really would. Because <laughs> uh, like, it's like, kind of like that Virginity Rocks brand. Have you heard of that brand, Virginity no. Rocks? It's it's literally just some dude in, in Florida that <laughs> made some brand called Virginity Rocks. I didn't yeah. even know. He had, he had a whole YouTube channel, mm. but... He made a branding deal with uh, Zoomies, I think. <laughs> this is kind of getting off topic. But, but like, yeah, this is the this is the fear I had if we'd start doing discussion. <laughs> it starts to get too uh, uh, what? too broad. Yeah, it's like uh, it, it bleeds into the um, patron content kind of. Oh, kind of. Does. <laughs> but um, yeah, let's try to keep it. Uh, no, I promise. I mean, it's fine though. But I yeah, promise we'll bring it back. I promise yeah, we'll yeah, circle yeah, back. Yeah, but yeah, yeah the uh, <laughs> the the. Uh, the the merch yeah so this person just came up with a merch idea of virginity rocks and no one knows it's, at least for me i didn't know it was tied back to some youtubers channel mm. and that's kind of how maybe this brand will be if we get it off the table what yeah, do you guys think so. what do you, what do y'all think that's a lot of work though merch design merch design his is so basic it's like i'll put it up for the listeners it's very basic it's just like literally like 90s kind of like uh powerpoint Text. Oh, okay, yeah. It's just like, virginity rocks. It's, it's, it's goofy. But anyway, um, today we're going to talk about Grover's algorithm. Mm. Grover. Grover. Yeah, yeah it's interesting, I, I actually. See your, I see your show notes. Yeah, yeah. They're quite extensive. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just wrote, I wrote a couple things, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah, but I have, par I have paragraphs, and but mine's more like a narrative, and yours is definitely like, you, 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 you're, yours is a shotgun spread. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, this I, is an or, this is an unorganized uh, list. No, no, no. This is way better f for me because uh, definitely need talking points because I dove into Grover's uh, stuff. Um, yeah, but mostly in in one perspective, mm. trying to describe it a little bit. Yeah. So for the audience, let's define 
what uh what did you I, I guess explaining it what, what the hell is Grover's algorithm yeah so Grover's algorithm is interesting because it's basically a sorting algorithm in some sense or it's related to or I'm sorry not sorting search algorithm it's related to search and I think maybe it's related to sorting because I think sorting and, and search algorithms are kind of related in some in some respects um, but it's a search algorithm basically so if you imagine you have like n an n number of let's say states or an n number of objects let's say Grover's algorithm is basically an algorithm to find a particular item within that n list of stuff right um, and the thing is it's it's a little bit more stronger than that because it's a quantum algorithm there's a classical version of Grover, Grover's algorithm but the, the quantum version is the one we're really concerned with um, right now right because yeah. you know the the cool the cool stuff right now the leading edge stuff is quantum yeah so the classical version is is simple and understandable but the quantum one is really the interesting one yeah well there's there's like an interesting paper uh by i think it was a paper by grover and i'll put it up here for the listeners but um yeah like it, you mean his 1996 paper or so it was the 96 paper yeah, yeah I where think he came so. out with it right yeah he, he like put in the abstract i think there was a i don't know if you saw it but he's like i propose to you a crossword puzzle do you see this one no. No. He he was just like, I have a crossword puzzle for you, and I'm trying to, I want you to f- try to find the word. Mm. It's blank blank, uh, blank blank blank, R, blank N H blank A. He's like, I want okay. you to think about how to, how would you solve this crossword puzzle? Now, if right. you had a computer, like, how mm-hmm. would you approach that with a computer? You could brute force, right? Yeah, Every yeah. letter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then just see all the different word combinations. Or maybe even smarter would be a lookup somehow of like, you know, common English words yeah. or something, right? Yeah. That follow that same format. Yeah, me too. I, w- I was like, yeah, my, my mind went to brute force too. I was just yeah. like. That's the first you always think of, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, because it's just like, I mean, you just tell the computer, all right, you know, search the database of words. like, And, and even the, the paper the author was saying. Like, let's say an online dictionary has a million words. Yeah. You're going to tell, you're going to look at this database, sort it alphabetically or something. Um, and you're going to tell the computer, all right, go through the list until mm-hmm. you find the word. Mm-hmm. Now, what's likely to happen is if by the time you reach 500,000, you'll probably find the match, right? Yeah. But um, but that's like going to take forever. Right. For like, you have it's to scan a Inefficient. Million. Yeah. But the quantum algorithm stuff is nice because, uh, as you know, how well actually qubits is something that I'm not really too familiar with. So qubits are because quantum everything is kind of a mystery to it because it doesn't al- align with your intuition, right? So you kind of have to yeah. accept these weird mathematical things and not really internalize them that well. Like, it, it, like for classical bits, it's kind of easier, right? Because it's like it 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 works off of binaries, right? Yeah, it's, zero state off, one state on. We yeah. can say, yeah. And it, but in quantum systems, it's both on and on, yeah. on and off, I guess. <laughs> yes, yeah, both zero and one at the same time. That's my favorite, I, I, my favorite quantum I, phrase. I mean, it's true in some sense, but I hate it because it's like it, it almost misleads you into classical intuition. It does. And actually, one resource that I really liked, and I, I saw your notes. You had IBM on here. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That, that yeah, was, that was like, a good one. That was a beautiful. Go go look it up. They have the IBM's uh, own version of a quantum computer. Yeah, it's the Qiskit, um, Q-I-S-K-I-T. Um, I didn't like the explanation as much, though, but it was a well-laid-out thing. Yeah, it was. Um, my favorite explanation was actually um, a YouTube video, but mm-hmm. even that was still wasn't enlightening enough. Mm-hmm. And to be perfectly frank with this, I still barely even understand what Qu- Rover's algorithm is. Yeah. Like, I have not internalized it. I could probably repeat back some surface level knowledge and things, mm. but I was hoping that maybe we can kind of just talk about it with this podcast. Yeah, yeah, because uh, this is definitely a, a topic that's like, I, I don't know, I was confused about because I needed some, I, I needed more, uh, yeah, like you're saying, like just talking through some of the facts because uh, you have... Because if you okay, because the problem that's posed, right? If you have a crossword puzzle, blah blah blah. If it takes you a million, if it's like searching through a million uh, terms, mm-hmm. it's going to take forever. But with Grover's algorithm, they say that they cut the 
computation time uh, by a what is it? A square root. A, a square root. Is it a square root or a quad? Yeah, quadratically, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, so let's say it took a million times, then it would reduce the computation time to a thousand. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that sounds about right. So, so the thing is, though, I I still don't see the intuition. Like, yeah, I barely got it too. It, it's like, how do you go? How do you even go from from saying okay, because because in most quantum systems, you you're able to scale th or solve things exponentially. Yeah, yeah. Because qubits allow for, um, how would you say? And this is so two. It's base two. Mm -hmm. to the n right for quantum yeah. systems yeah yeah so like that's an exponential to the number of bits in objects your system, or right? whatever yeah bits yeah. in your system qubits qubits and that that's a huge computation power compared to classical computers do you remember what it what the mathematical order is for that because i don't mm, no and i also think it depends on the algorithm you're running as yeah, well true. right because yeah. grover's algorithm is only a square root of n yeah. um uh, number of steps or whatever yeah um and then there's some that are like n log n and we're yeah. talking about big o notation but if you're not familiar big o notation is kind of the the o i think stands for order yeah and it has to do with like um uh, uh quantifying the number of evaluations you need to do to solve a particular mm -hmm. problem with that algorithm so they they quantify these algorithms using big o notation to you know try to sh to show the time it would take to actually do these computations. Of course, you can, it's not a direct measure of time. I think it's a, it's a measure of steps mm -hmm. because, you know, you would translate time depending on whatever your computer would be. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, and you can, and I guess your time would be a function of the big O notation. Yeah. Yeah, um, big O notation. That that was stuff that I was like, what the hell is that? Yeah, you never, you never seen it before no, this? No, no, no. Okay. I don't think, well, maybe I've seen it and I always kind of brushed it off. Yeah. It's like when you read stuff on Wikipedia and you go on the math page and yeah. you just see a bunch of terms. And right, you're like, like anyway, skip. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, I'm not sure what this means. I'm just going right. to skip through it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, th so, so on top of the square root thing, it, it was kind of hard to, to gauge what they were trying to say, but obviously working through it um, kind of made me like, be like, how can we, how can we answer it in a way that's, that makes the most sense? Like, how are you able to get um, N to, or one over, which essentially N to the negative one half, right? One over square root of N. Yeah, sure. Um, and it, it, there's a lot of uh, abstractions and you have to know a little bit about quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. um, most of the linear, linear algebra stuff. Um, yeah. Like, did you feel, did you feel like, uh, like to even read this kind of stuff, what did you feel like you needed to, to, to take? Well, was it missing pieces? Yeah. So for me, I thought it was mostly just, um, I, I, I think I would have had to go to the math. Yeah. So I only, I, I will admit, I only went through probably about half of the math. Yeah. Um, but I think I would have had to actually do the calculation myself mm -hmm. because there's one thing I don't really understand um, with the Grover's algorithm is how many times you have to run the um, algorithm. Yeah. So I guess if we kind of step through it, you can just, you can, you can break it down into these certain steps. So with the quantum algorithm, you have the first, of course you have your, let's say your two qubits, mm -hmm. right? And um, those two qubits get a Hadamard gate on them, which puts them in superposition. Then the next step happens where they actually get put into a, what they call an oracle. Yeah. And the oracle is just another component that's like a magical component that can do some, it's a general component, it's a black box component that can do some operation in a single yeah. step. And then they put it through another Hadamard gate, another oracle, another Hadamard, and then they measure. So... I think I would have had to actually go through that whole step-by-step -step process mathematically to really understand it. Um, but it was just a little bit difficult. Um, although I did find some videos that were kind of interesting on it, mm -hmm. um, that I have on, on the, sh on the, um, notes there, even we might be able to take a look. Okay. So in this video, I'm going to describe to you 
the steps of Grover's algorithm and um, why it runs in square root of n steps. And then it won't be clear to you how we actually implement the steps yet. So we'll, in the next video, I'll show you how we actually implement the steps. Here's the problem again. We are given a table of with capital N entries, one of which is special, and we want to find that special entry. OK, so there are two steps to the algorithm. The first is called phase inversion. So let me assume that the special entry is x star. So f of x star equal to 1, that's what we are looking for. So at any given iteration of the algorithm, so the, the algorithm will work in a number of iterations. And actually, the number of iterations is going to be square root of n. So at any iteration, what the algorithm maintains is a superposition over all x. So it maintains some superposition, sum over all x of alpha x, x. Now, yeah, I'm going to pause here real quick because uh, the phase inversion thing kind of didn't make sense to me. But, Same. Um, but I found a good, like, kind of explanation. Okay. So the way to think about it is, like, if it's, like, Sudoku. You have a game like Sudoku, mm -hmm. right? You know you know how to get... How would I say this? Uh, you know how to... You know how the game of Sudoku is. You know how to win. You have to, yeah. you have to follow a certain set of rules, right? Sure. So the idea is that you have to your algorithm goes through and sees how many steps were taken following the rules. And if the rules were followed, then you would get a one. It doesn't tell you like essentially how the game is won. It just tells you the game, the rules were followed. Does that make any sense? No. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, let me see if I can pull up the direct quote here. It says here, what makes Grover's algorithm so powerful is how easy it is to convert a problem to an oracle of this form. There are many computational problems which is difficult to find a solution, but relatively easy to verify verify a solution. So we can easily verify a solution to Sudoku by checking all the rules are satisfied. For these problems, we can create a function that takes a pro proposed solution and returns uh, zero if X is not a solution or one if it's a valid solution. So that's kind of how I guess it's this phase inversion thing where you you get a you get a zero one kind of thing. No, I wouldn't call no. it the phase inversion because the phase inversion has to do with like um, when you are locating the answer. It seemed. Yeah, so, I thought, but this is kind of what they're arguing it in the IBM um, here uh, page. They're arguing that you ba it, it's Grover's algorithm is really a function inversion in some way. Yeah. It like well, the nice easy way to say that with the function version was saying that given any y, yeah, um, given given an equation of y equals f of x, mm -hmm. when you know the y value, Grover's algorithm should be able to find the x value. I see. So well, because the way they're putting it is, it's essentially you you don't find a solution, but you verify that you have a solution. Yeah. 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 So in some way, it's like, okay, an answer does exist, but we don't know what that answer is, I guess. No, I think it's supposed to also find the solution too, though, with um, a certain probability. Maybe so, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So so for those of you, I guess, that may, may not be comfortable, right? I, I also read a very interesting way of thinking about superposition mm -hmm. uh, in colloquial terms, mm -hmm. weighted sums. A weighted or difference of sums. Sure, yeah. Which is something that I really didn't really kind of conceptualize till I read it, but I was like, oh, oh no, that's you true. mean with the coefficients? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I knew that's like okay, superposition is a linear combination, but mm -hmm. when people say that, it doesn't really tell you anything. Yeah, it's better to just say weighted. Yeah, weighted sum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I guess it makes more sense because now you're thinking more in the computer in the computer uh, linear algebra uh, framework now. Right. And that's how they do, like, you know, machine learning and things. They have yeah. these weighted sums, basically, these strings of weighted sums that adjust these values to give you a particular answer based on, you know, 
like if it's if it's recognizing some visual element, it will scale their different parameters depending on what's uh, what the element is. But the Grover's mm-hmm. algorithm, I don't really understand still in terms of that. Um, I just didn't I didn't fully understand it because of the whole. I think um, the fact that it's like they already they already are like assuming that you know where the answer is. Um, or I don't know if that's correct. I just sure. You That's know, your impression. Let, yeah, maybe let's watch the um, continue on with uh, yeah. Vaz Zirani's, and maybe I'll have maybe a better answer uh, some questions. <laughs> yeah, I'll have a more of an enlightened uh, thought yeah. on it. Okay, go for it. As you can imagine, initially, we have no idea what which value x we are looking for. So initially, all these alpha sub x's are going to be equal and equal to one over square root of n. Okay, now, what does this phase inversion step do? What it does is it changes the superposition like this. If x is not equal to x prime, sorry, if x is not the special element, then it just leaves it alone. But if if x is the special element, then it inverts the phase. So it replaces it by minus alpha x star. Okay, so Let me show you what this means pictorially. So let's say that this is our point x star. So that's the amplitude of x star. That's x star minus 1. That's x star plus 1. So what happens here? Well, that's x star plus 1. That's x star minus 1. And so all this and this is left unchanged. What happens to this one is that it gets inverted. So instead of this amplitude, now we replace it by that. Yeah, pause. Okay, so whatever it was, we... Yeah, so he already knows what the special element is, x star. It's like, if you're trying to find the special element, or maybe I'm misunderstanding what the special element is, because it's like... It seems like it already is assuming that you know what the special element is. Yeah, the mathematics, all it's saying here is that, like, okay, we're summing over all x states, right? Yeah. We're summing all, all, all over the x states, and we get weighted values, but then they do mm-hmm. a phase inversion, and right. then they select for states that are not in... Well, it seems like the phase inversion is there to isolate out the value that you want to find. But it's like if you already knew that, then what was, what's the point of going through all this, you know, this crap here? So I, that's the part that I didn't really understand, which is why I think I'd have to step through the whole <laughs> algorithm. Because I'm like, if you already know what the element is, then you don't need to phase invert the element because you already know what it is. The whole point of Grover, Grover's algorithm is to find the special element, I thought. But I don't know. Maybe we should continue on. Okay, so let's I continue can, on. Maybe, maybe he'll yeah. fill in the gaps. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, okay, keep going. We take minus of that. Okay, so that's the first operation. The second operation is called inversion about the mean. So again, we, we start with the superposition sum alpha x, x, for all x. And now, what does this inversion about the mean do? So we let mu be the mean. So it's summation of alpha x divided by n. So it's just the average value. It's the average value of all the amplitudes. So here, I don't know what it looks like. Maybe just eyeballing it, possibly that might be the average. So now what we do is we flip the amplitudes about this mean. So what does it mean to flip it? What it does is alpha x gets mapped to 2 times mu minus alpha x, meaning that summation alpha x x goes to summation 2 mu minus alpha x. What's 2 mu minus alpha x? It's, it's just mu plus mu minus alpha x. So what does this mean? What it's saying is, Say that alpha x is smaller than mu, then what does it do? It takes, say it's smaller by this value, and what it does is it takes mu plus however much it's smaller. So it flips it up by exactly the same amount. 
And the same thing happens if it's above. It flips it down by exactly the same amount. So the new amplitudes would look something like this. So that's what I inversion about the mean does. Now... Yeah, I don't know why you just couldn't draw that first. <laughs> <laughs> the equations were kind of just like, whatever. Yeah, I'm not sure just what you're sorting Just flip the wave. <laughs> anyway. In invert, inverted about the mean, quite yeah. literally. Yeah. Um, it's no more complicated than it sounds. It's literally just flip the wave around the median value. It should not be a priori clear to you that inversion about the mean is a unitary transformation. Leave alone that, can be, that it can be implemented efficiently. It might be a little bit more clear to some of you that inversion, that phase inversion is a unitary operation. And then if you can guess how to implement it, then that's a really great thing. Okay, but, but we are going to see how to do that in the next video. Yeah, so you, you like unitary operations are like um, something that comes up a lot in quantum like computing. Yeah, yeah. And that's something that a lot of people, I guess, I don't know, I, I guess as physicists, we kind of just take it for granted, I think, mm -hmm. uh, when we talk about it. Because, um, like, it, in day to day kind of life, unitary stuff, unitary operations are things that essentially is a fancy way of saying that things are, um, how would you say, are reversible. Okay. Right? Yeah, so like unitary operators in like they're mathematically um how would you say? It, it's kind of like uh multiplying by 1. It, it's really the in linear algebra they preserve probability amplitudes and uh and like I think formally they like in linear algebra they preserve length and the vectors or something. Sure. Right? Yeah. You remember this? No. <laughs> I just know it's something that you need for quantum. It's it's math <laughs> details that I don't really. It is care it that is definitely for. math details. Um, just know all operators have to be unitary, and that's all I care about. You know. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're supposed to preserve probability amplitudes, and um, and that's something that I, it's obviously if you want to if you want to see something real, it needs to preserve the probability amplitudes, right? Like yeah. using the Born rule thing. Yeah. So yeah. a lot of op there's we have a limited set of operations that that are unitary. Yeah. So I guess we have to have that constraint, right? Yeah. It's a it's a constraint of quantum. Yeah. It's a little bit bogged down in the in the math details yeah. though. But, but that's like whatever. but that's a that's for me that was a clear dis that's a distinction to make clear because uh, it, it's we have a limited set of things that we can do like the what is it what did you call it a quant the quantum gates thing is also something i'm not familiar i wasn't familiar with well the quantum gates are just like the poly x poly y poly z gates just like mm -hmm. we did in from class you know the yeah. angular momentum lx ly lz those have the same well not exactly but yeah. um poly x poly y poly z are quantum gates yeah. the hadamard gate is just a combination of like the poly x and the poly z times this one ha uh, one over the square root of two or something mm -hmm. and all they do is they just they just flip the quantum states of zero and one. Yeah. So rotations. if you have two qubits, you would have a yeah. state like, or if you have, uh, yeah, if you have two qubits, um, zero or one state, you would have a qubit that's either zero one, which I think would be the one state, mm -hmm. or a qubit that's a one zero. Um, and these are um, matrix matrices. Yeah. No, but I, but I know that these are rotations in in like well, unitary operations are are essentially. Um, yeah, they're well, they can be considered rotations sphere. in vector space. Yeah. yeah, yeah. At the end of the day, but that's just all. It's all. It's all math. Who cares? Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, like, it, it, but I think it's important to say because, like, these quantum gates, if they're supposed to be unitary, like, I, I didn't know what the hell they, what the hell they were, like, quantum gates. What the hell? Feels like. Yeah, you're like, what is it? But if you, but like you even can, when you said oracle, I was like, what the hell is an oracle? <laughs> but that's actually more like in the realm of the computer science side. Like, the reason that you were unfamiliar is because we don't really learn that in school. The only reason I know is because I just researched it on my own time, right? <laughs> so yeah. it has nothing to do with, like, I mean, it has something to do with physics if you're in quantum computing, right? Yeah. But we don't care as much yeah. because we're not actually doing quantum computing operations, right? We no. do the theory. So we know of the poly X gate. We know of poly Y and poly Z gates. Yeah. But we don't really know what the application is for. And one of those applications happens to be quantum gates. So if right. you know like a regular logic gate, like the and or or gate in yeah. 
I don't know. Are you familiar with regular logic even one? Yeah, so you don't have slightly. to learn it either. No, huh? we don't have. Yeah, that's the thing in physics. We yeah. don't. We don't have to. Do yeah, this, this is like comp sci slash engineering guy stuff. Yeah. We don't have to learn logic gate stuff. No, I mean I'm I'm not really familiar with like logic gate stuff. Like I think as far as physics goes, we just do um, uh, circuits. Yeah. Yeah. So. You know, though, conditional statements like in computer science, like mm-hmm. if you do, um, like, what's your um, p- familiar program, your most familiar programming language? Uh, let's just say MATLAB. MATLAB, okay. <laughs> I guess they probably have if-then statements. Yeah, they do, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. the conditional statements, like, let's say if you have, like, if X is equal to Y and X is equal to Z, then you perform some operation. Yeah. The and is a conditional, is a logic gate, essentially. Yeah. So, like, logic gates would be an AND gate, an OR gate, or whatever. Mm. They allow you to have these conditional statements where you can do mm. comparisons between um, quantities. Yeah. And that's the exact same thing, like, what would be in a circuit, except it's in physical form. Mm. So, with a logic gate, it would just be, like, for an AND gate, it would say, oh, you let current A through. If current A is on and current B is on with an AND gate, now you can let... Um, current through that AND gate. Right. So it's just, that's that's all it is, right? Mm-hmm. That's that's basically the entirety of a computer, how it's made up to actually do operations. Yeah. If you have a NAND gate or an XOR gate, you can make any logical gate, which means that you can build any computer mm-hmm. or any Turing machine, if you want to get even more yeah. like precise with it. I see. Okay. So and then the-, the quantum gate is just the quantum version of that, right? So now you have it. You have these special gates, these specialty gates, like the Hadamard gate, let's say, or like the, um, I think maybe the Toffoli gate is one. It's kind of more complicated. Um, and the CNOT gate is also very important in quantum mechanics. So you have like these special gates in quantum mechanics where you can actually exploit superposition now mm. and entanglement features. So the Hadamard gate is one of the main quantum gates that puts things in superposition. Yeah. So now you can turn your zero qubit into this superposition state of a combination of zero and one. Yeah, my thing is like, I mean, if these are rotations, I'm trying to think about it like... Mathematically? More abstract? Well, more... I'm trying to think about the physics that's going on. Like, like if you apply a Hadamard gate, or Hadamard... I forgot how to Yeah, Hadamard. Hadamard gate. Yep. That's the, basically the superposition gate. Yeah, it, it puts your system in superposition, uh, which, for one, I'm like, how? what kind of physical thing are you doing? Yeah, you know I know, what I mean? right? Because, like, like, I mean, it's easy in the abstract to think about this stuff. Like, it's like, oh, yeah, 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 you just apply the gate and yeah. then whatever, whatever. But, because, um, I mean, physically, right, what's happening is, like, even in IBM's construct of their, what did you call it, a QI something? Oh, the Q skit? Q skit. Do you know about it? Uh, I'm not familiar. barely. I know there's a bunch of Twitter people that we follow that are yeah. like Q skit experts. Oh, cool. I think um, I think Olivia Lanes we follow on Twitter. Nice. She's a uh, part of the Q skit project. I think yeah. Abe As Asvar, whatever his last name is, mm-hmm. I forget. He's in Q skit. Nice Q skit guy. Um, well, so yeah, there's there's yeah. physicists who do it. I, for I sure. know that they use superconducting qubits. Oh, and, IBM does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and but the thing is, it's not like the classical kind of. Um, the the ideal quantum qubit system it's but they suppose they're they're using um, I thought it was well according to the IBM webpage they're using a uh, a sort of how would I say a, a fancy exotic state for oh. the, uh, to get their their superposition I see I see um, it, it's it's fascinating the way they they do it I think they do they use a material to get a sort of um, quasi particle kind of state for a qubit. Okay. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's it's interesting. Um, you don't know anything about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, if so any, if any, there. yeah, if any IBM people are watching below, please please comment on it because I I do want to know more about your your little quantum system here. Mm-hmm. Um, as a physicist, as an experimental physicist, I do want right. to kind of dig into. Um, like what the heck you're using, right? There's another person that we also follow. Um, well, mm-hmm. not anymore, I guess. What happened? Because <laughs> we got, got mad at us? blocked by her. But um, Anastasia oh. Marchenkova is a uh, she's mm-hmm. a quantum um 
expert. She's a quantum expert at um. At damn, I forget where it's at. It yeah, I think, but I don't know what her system. I don't know what the system's called. But she has a ton of great videos on quantum mechanics stuff. Yeah. Um, I wish I keep putting on her videos to can she show us in the lab? <laughs> uh-huh. But she hasn't been able to show we'll uh, show up. it yet. Um, I don't know why, but I think uh, it'd be really interesting because it's it's exactly the same questions that I have with you is um, like what's actually going on? Like how do you put a, something in superposition in real life? Like what is that even doing? Yeah. Well, Which that's... beats me, honestly. I mean, I think that maybe the normal state is just superposition if you're not interacting, right? Because that's the whole deal with, like, you know, Einstein saying does the moon even exist, you know, yeah. if you're not looking at it. And that has to do with the whole fact that maybe if something's not being observed or measured, it's in super, superposition. Yeah. Right? Because if you think of Young's double slit experiment, right? Yeah. When you, send the, when you send the electron just on its own through the slit, then it makes the interference pattern. And an interference pattern happens when it's in a state of superposition. Yeah. So I'm thinking maybe that's just like keeping your particle isolated, isolated. from any interactions. Yeah, that that is that is state. a and that's something that I came to when I was looking at this uh, IBM's the quantum uh, website because because they they were talking about how they're able to put the system into superposition. Um, yeah, but uh, the way IBM achieves this is by is by using a 15 millikelvin dilution fridge. So mm. they have a 15 millikelvin like so dilution fridges are these huge things. Yeah. We, yeah. we had one in our in our group. Right. Um but it's this huge literally tub This is the cylinder. chandelier thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a huge dilution fridge and you have I guess in the in the IBM picture, mm-hmm. they have this superconducting material on silicon. Yeah, and <clears throat> and then it's a, it's supposed to approximate a two qubit system. Okay, so I guess they get into a certain state, and the mm. system starts behaving um, in this way. But the thing is, if I want to see the technical papers to show me the Hamiltonian. Like I want to see, I want to see what, (laughs) like what's actually going on here. Like a whole paper on just how to put a particle in, how to put a qubit in superposition. That's a paper that would be really nice. But this is the thing. I I know that this is out there, but a lot of the stuff is behind paywalls too. And then even then, like those are trade secrets. Like, yeah, true. true. You know what I mean? Like, the, but the physics has got to be out there, right? Because you couldn't yeah. make these systems without the physics. Well, because the physics is like, I, I, you and I kind of can kind of suppose the physics, and that's something that that they're, I think they're free to say because they're saying yeah. here they said in the IBM page that they wait for the qubit system to reach a ground state. Yeah, so I which think is that's zero. I think that's the superposition state. Yeah. So, like you're saying with the millikelvin thing, mm-hmm. they're having to cool it down. So that there's no quantum fluctuations within the atom. It's yeah. it's like basically almost absolute zero, right? It's so yeah. still. It has no energy come no energy. It's basically in the ground state. So it's um it's got no interaction. It doesn't interact yeah. with anything. Yeah. Um like from there they they say from there is when you can start doing measurements or performing measurements. Yeah, that makes sense. I think it does make sense. And um and the measurements they say in quantum computing these these are these are uh you use quantum gates so i guess what they do is pump current or pulse current currents through the through the silicon or something and maybe mm. a certain s- signal to do something yeah cuz cuz if you cuz i saw there's other gates where they shift phases and stuff yeah so they they pump current i guess in certain signs uh you use signs right we use in uh sorry uh, when we want to send um, signals mm-hmm. through currents, we use like um, what is the word I'm looking for? We use lock-ins and, yeah, and these kinds sure. of things and and uh, current sources. Yeah, right. So what I'm presume is happening is mm-hmm. they're sending currents through this qubit system, but in such a way where you won't destroy <laughs> the superposition. You know what I mean? Like. Well, no. I think as soon as you're, as soon as you're interacting Sorry, with the yeah, you're mall, right. with you the destroy atom, it. you're destroying, you're destroying, yeah, you the destroy the superposition. State. But yeah. you want to minimize the amount of, because when you apply these Hadamard gates or yeah. whatever Hadamard mm-hmm. gates or whatever, these it's the same thing as performing a measurement because. This is probably the dumbest we'll look on the podcast too, <laughs> just to clarify because people don't really see the um 
the real process of how we have to think things. through things. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They usually see the cleaned up version where yeah. we've done all the research and we only say like the real um the real stuff. The real like, you know, um yeah. basic things. But this is just to for the audience to know, this is like the real process of what me and one have to do when we actually try to, are trying to figure out what's going on. Right. So we're trying a little new stuff. But anyway, yeah. I wanted to just put that aside just in claim case people yeah, are like, yeah. why are they sounding so dumb now? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, the thing is, um, like in their system, it's a two-level system. Yeah. With zero, you have a two-level system in quantum mechanics that we deal with all the time. It's zero and one states. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's the most basic state, plus minus, right? Yeah. And it, it, it's just... It's just weird to me because when you you were saying we we have the thermal energy of the of the system given like KBT, K, yeah, is it Boltzmann constant times the temperature. Sure, that has to be much less than the frequency, which is H times F. The 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 particle H times omega. H, H times bar omega, times H omega. Bar, H bar times omega. Yeah. I guess if you yeah if you do the unit conversions. Or yeah, whatever. yeah. Yeah, H bar times omega. So your right. particle energy or frequency has to be much higher than that of the, the thermal energy around it. Something like and that. And that's what IBM was saying. They were like, well, we keep our the frequency of the qubit system orders of magnitude higher than the environment. So, mm -hmm. but to me, it's strange because I'm like, okay. How are you incre how are you influencing the quantum system to have an increased frequency much higher above the the uh, the, the thermal you know like how you're saying to avoid what is it what did you say quantum fluctuations yeah I guess so you're saying they're cooling around the particles because that would make sense too maybe because uh -huh. you're cooling around the particles so everything around it is not interacting with yeah the qubit yeah that actually makes sense. Yeah, I'm wondering that makes because, more because sense. like because imagine if you're pumping current through something, yeah, you're gonna heat it up. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, and, yeah, and 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 I, and I know this has to do with a little bit about entropy too because they were saying like, I mean KBT yeah. temperature entropy all this stuff. There's right. so many ways to think about it. But um, but yeah, they try to minimize ambient noise and heat that would disrupt the qubit, and um, that makes sense. And yeah. So I guess the local environment of the qubit has to be below a certain energy because otherwise, if it wasn't, then it would be able to interact with the particle. But since it's below the energy of the particle, it can't actually any kind of it won't be able to actually interact with the particle because mm -hmm. the particle is always going to have higher energy than the environment, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you still have to get the particle to the ground state, I guess. So it can't be excited. Yeah, it has to be at the lowest ground energy of the system. Yeah, I'm Which not is, sure why that is, but... Well, because like, I was thinking back to our fundamentals, right? Our physics fundamentals. Yeah. Particles in a box. Yeah. Ideally, we want, like... When we observe the quantum, the quantum behavior is when you have the particle isolated from any sort of outside... Uh, you, don't, you don't want the particle to start behaving uh, in an ensemble or kind of like... Uh, how would I say this? In, in more of a molecular type Well, just of way you don't emerging. want it to have interactions. Yeah, you don't want to have outside interactions. Just mm -hmm. kind of observe the particle on its own. Yeah. And when you see the particle in the box situation, yeah, it's 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 literally just the particle by itself, and that's when right. you can have it do operations, I guess. Maybe there is a reason why we will learn particle in a box, right? No, yeah. And of course, when you're an undergrad, you're just like, I don't give a fuck what the reason <laughs> is. I'm just trying to pass this class. <laughs> but there's always the interesting one, like the infinite square well potential. Yeah. Right? Which I've always found was interesting. And it's, re I think literally, it's just like, if you imagine a particle, like, just surrounded by an, in, an infinite box where it can't tunnel through anywhere. Yeah. Um, it's bound by it's local environment somehow it's yeah. it's boxed in it's yeah it literally can't tunnel anywhere because the box is just it's an infinite potential in some sense yeah that's not really saying well it's saying it, it, the energy over over, to scale uh it to, just can't leave it's it can't, trapped yeah it's trapped it's everywhere in space except for that little section it exists in yeah is occupied with some particle and or we something. do have these ion trapped ion yeah uh, systems right and i think that's why they're useful because yeah. um when you have this infinite square well, let's imagine the real picture of the particle where it's surrounded by, you know, 
this potential or something. It's just mm-hmm. the environment is so cooled down to this millikelvin or whatever, mm-hmm. this 15 millikelvin that it literally cannot interact with the particle. So the particle mm-hmm. is just on its own in this tr- in this trapped region, you could say. Mm-hmm. This is all speculation, so giant asterisks on this. This is this is super <laughs> discussion mode where me and Juan are trying to figure this out. So Yeah, the physical picture of this. Use um, this as just a uh, guide for your own knowledge. Do your own physical <laughs> intuition. We're trying to build the physical intuition to this. And if you're an IBM yeah. person, please, please let yeah. us know because yeah. we'll love to have you on to talk about your <laughs> quantum supercomputer thing. Uh, and maybe explain how you perform quantum algorithms because, uh, or how it translates. Are you pumping a current through it? Are you, how are you sending a signal to perform these measurements, these Hadamard right. gates, Hadamard gates, these uh, different kinds of, you know, Z axis rotations and whatnot. Right, right. Are you literally sending a code to the <laughs> a current? I imagine it's got to be currents. Like what else yeah, do we have? I know right? you're pumping sick because that's how we send signals yeah ac signals to the to the system right i'm not sure exactly how it's doing it or you know because the thing is like we're using that's electrical engineering for uh, like that's not that's not something that we that's integrated into our teaching right yeah and the thing is i think it's also using the spin moment of the um particle too so it's like somehow it's controlling the spin (laughs) <laughs> or well, no, I guess the spin it either go it either collapses up or down, right? We always yeah. know that once you once you um, measure the particle, you know it's either spin up or spin down. Yeah. Um. And, yeah, this is interesting and, stuff. And, no, but I we know. We need to do more. Uh, and here's research. my here's my other question. So, in the particle that's in a in the well or um, the free particle situation. Mm-hmm. Um. You have the contribution of pure just kinetic energy, so it's just the particle, and it's it's um, there's there's no potential, right? It's a free particle. I wonder if that's how if that is well, that- there is potential. It's in the outer regions, though. Just no, there's no potential in that region. Right, 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 right. There's nothing, and I guess the but that's what I'm wondering how what the Hamiltonian looks like for these quantum bit systems. Are we keeping? How are we keeping them in in it might in, just in be like the infinite square well potential. You like try to create situations where it looks it looks like that. Yeah, I would think like you're talking about the trapped ion situation. Yeah. That would be maybe my first guess, sure. but I'm not sure. Maybe the other, maybe it doesn't. I don't know. Maybe they vary in uh, application. Yeah, right. Because yeah. different different um, companies probably use different kinds of uh, Hamiltonians. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So different who knows, potentials. man? I'm not sure. Because you can, the, another way to do it is you can put a, a particle in a um, in a magnetic field because you can get splitting, quantum splitting as well. Mm. You know what I mean? The Hamiltonian can take on that. Um, yeah, but that's not going to be for a quantum computing system. Yeah, I don't think so. Because <laughs> if you're putting it in a magnetic field, you're disturbing the state, right? Um, well, maybe not necessarily. No, because you can still get you can mm. still get zero or one. I I don't I don't know. There it's still fun. You can still have a fundamentally quantum system with with you with the looking, particle in the magnetic field. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Depending on the result, we have to investigate. Yeah, we'd that have one. to look more into the uh, <laughs> the details of it. But I'm it's I'm being rem, I'm being reminded of this. But hmm. yeah, I, w- I would like to know more about how they're able to implement. Uh, these kinds of technologies because in applying the Grover's algorithm in this case, the sorting, uh, well, not sorting algorithm. Searching algorithm. Searching yeah, algorithm. I kept saying sorting as well. <laughs> the searching <laughs> algorithm, like, I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see how they perform these operations because in the abstract, like, you're, like, this guy's writing. Yeah. He's writing these mathematical things. Right. Okay, well, we tell the algorithm to search for the mean. Yeah. It's like, yeah, okay, we get it, right? <laughs> And even then, we don't really get it. It's like, yeah, that's that's something that I want to see more as well of is more the experimental side of quantum stuff because we've heard a million times it can be zero or one at the same time. We've heard a million times you need superposition and entanglement. We've heard a million times about the block sphere. It's like we need to start doing some quantum content out here that actually explains what's happening with these quantum gates and, and the like, you know. It's like yeah. I'm, I'm sick of just hearing the math. It's like, okay. It's fine and all, but what is actually going on? Yeah, especially with the entanglement thing, because yeah. like if we're talking about an entangled in what sense? Like, are the ain't the momenta entangled? I would imagine yes. Like, 
Well, I tried doing if, this one back in the day when we were going to do quantum information like sure. a, year a year ago. ago yeah. um, and the thing that I kept finding was these photon entanglement mm -hmm. experiments where somehow you would use like a half wave plate or something where a photon would go in through the wave plate and then it would split into two photons basically. So it would get divided. Like just how you know when you have your sunglasses. Well, maybe that's a bad ex analogy. The polarizers but, and stuff? Yeah, but that's yeah. probably a bad analogy. Sure. But a half wave plate f can somehow split your photon in two directions. So it's basically like it divides the energy up. Yeah. And then somehow that means they're entangled now. Yeah. Um, and that's the most, for me, that would be where I would start if I'm trying to figure out exactly what entanglement means in real life. Yeah. Um, because that seemed like the most simplest um, yeah. and version. And, and photons behave differently than most of the quantum stuff that we see with the, the quantum bit stuff. I think photons behave, they're bosons. So, yeah. you know, they, they, it's different from like the regime of fermions, which are more like, electrons and stuff where we we're sure but they still have the wave particle duality which is right. at the end of the day that's the quantum yeah. part right yeah that's what we're concerned with yeah um anyway anyway yeah. i want let's go back to the grover he's he's about to get into the grover's algorithm right. i just kind of wanted to lay out what the hell my questions were sure sure because he's about to answer what the hell grover's algorithm is <laughs> <laughs> i wouldn't get your hopes up though because i watched this whole video and i didn't really still, still... scratching your head yeah, okay yeah. all right okay Okay, so now let me try to show you how Grover's algorithm works, given these two primitives. Okay, so as I said, initially we know nothing at all about the marked element, and so we start with all our amplitudes equal and equal to 1 over square root n. Then what do we do? Well, we do a phase inversion. So now the marked element, instead of having amplitude 1 over square root n, it has amplitude minus 1 over square root n. Now we want to do an inversion about the mean. So what's the mean? Well, it would have been 1 over square root n if we hadn't done the phase inversion. What the phase inversion does is it lowers the mean just a little bit. OK, so what happens now when we invert about the mean? Well. Everything except S, X star, its amplitude drops by a little bit. It drops as much below the mean as, as it was above the mean before. But now what happens to X star? Well, when we flip it up, it goes as much above this mean as it was below. Well, it was below by about 2 over square root n. So it goes up 2 over square root n approximately above this mean. And the mean was approximately at 1 over square root n. So x star got its amplitude increased by about 2 over square root n in these two steps. Right? It increased from 1 over square root n to 3 over square root n, roughly. OK, so now how do we proceed from here? Well, since this works so well for us, what we are going to do is just keep doing these steps over and over again. What I claim is that if we do this, these steps over and over again, we just, you know, if we do phase inversion followed by inversion by mean, each time we do this, we increase this amplitude of x star by about 2 over square root n. So assuming this is the case, we'll go to 5 over square root n, 7 over square root n, 9 over square root n, we just keep going this way, and in roughly square root n steps, we'll have increased this amplitude to about 1 over square root 2. At this point, if we were to measure the chance that we see x star, the, the, the needle in the haystack, the marked element that we are looking for, is roughly 1 over 2. It's the square of this, this amplitude. And so then we are done. In roughly square root n steps, we'd have found the marked element. So now let's, you know. This is definitely galaxy brain stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what I was saying. It's like, it looked like it was promising in the beginning, yeah. but it still didn't explain shit if you really think about it. Yeah, especially like it, it's saying, okay, and this is something if you go, it, 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 there's a thing with Grover's algorithm that, I, that exposes 
uh, the answer to you and they call it phase amplification. And yeah. that didn't make sense to me because I'm like, okay, well, according to this video, you, it, it sort of boosts a signal for the thing that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. Which is strange to me too, right? Because I'm like, the whole marked element thing throws me off. So I'm like, if you already know what the marked element is, and you're boosting that signal, then you already know the answer. It's like, why even? Yeah, I don't get it. That's why I, say, I think I have to see how the program runs. Like, is yeah. it multiple iterations? Is it is the mark element just a random choice in that set? And then I'm like, if that happens, then it's just going to boost refine. whatever the element is. It's like... Right, so is it like you do see. one sweep? Right, then, that's what I'm thinking. And then, and then in that one sweep, it boosts the signal? Right. Yeah. That's what I'm but I'm like, but then how does that actually help you find the answer? I don't really see that. Well, because I guess in one, if you do one measurement and then it finds the, well, it finds a close mark. Yeah. So it finds the target, but the target, the signal is still weak. But how does it know the target? Are you saying it randomly it finds, selects the target? Yeah. Let's just say, let's just say it finds a hit. Any hit. But the hit is, it's, there's still a lot of noise around it. So you have to do multiple. Yeah, but iterations. how would it know a hit? Because the thing is, it's a it's a randomly ordered set. There should be no indicator of what a hit should be. Like it uh -huh. doesn't know what a tar like this Gro Grover's algorithm should be applied to any randomly sorted, randomly unsorted list. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't know any information about the list. So yeah, the thing no. is, like you can understand the classical version of this, the very easy or the very easy way to do this if you want to find some element in a list, you just brute force check each entry right check n entries which is mm -hmm. why a classical al algorithm has n evaluations mm -hmm. to get to the answer but for some reason with grover is using this quantum superposition of all the n states and this phase inversion and meet and and you know uh, uh, uh mean mean inversion or inversion about the mean they somehow get it in a square root of n steps but i'm not seeing how that's happening because it's like you still don't know what the target is like you know what the, you know what you're looking for, yeah. but you don't know where in the set it is. But he's he's saying this marked element, which to me feels like he's saying, um, you already know you already know the answer. <laughs> and I, I'm not seeing how to how to um, you know how to piece his explanation together or reverse engineer his explanation from this. And every resource I've checked, I really have not been able to do that. Which well, is why I'm like, I think the only way I'm going to understand this is if I actually build the algorithm myself and step through it all. Yeah. Well, you, you want to see what IBM has to say? Sure. It's intriguing. They say, I mean, they, they harp on a lot of the same things that we're saying. They said, before yeah. looking at the list of items, we have no idea where the marked item is. It's true. Okay, good. Therefore, any guess of its location is as good as any other, which we both agree on, which can be, exp but they say it can be expressed in terms of a uniform superposition, right, which is something that they wrote comfortably, 1 over square root of n, x. Right, which state. is just saying all the states and their respective probabilities are all the same. Yeah. If at this point we were to measure in the standard basis, the superposition would collapse, according to the fifth, whatever, uh, would collapse to any of the basis states with the same probability of 1 over n or 1 over 2 to the n. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then it says, our chances of guessing the right value omega, or the when you get the right eigenvalue for this, is therefore one and two to the n. Sure. Hence, on average, we would not we would need to try about two to the n times to guess the correct answer. Okay, Does that makes sense. Because like, because to me, what it's saying is okay. So, the quantum system, it, it's essentially you're going to have to perform the calculation. Two to the n times, depending on the the size of n being the small n being the mm -hmm. qubit, the size of mm -hmm. your qubit system. But uh, with the ampl amplitude amplification, um, it stretches out, or it basically amplifies the amplitude of the result, is what this is saying. So, yeah, I don't get that. That's the only problem. Because <laughs> how did it know the result? So I, that's what I'm saying. I think when you perform the measurement, uh, it. so going back to what they were saying here, if at this point we were to measure in the standard basis, mm -hmm. it would collapse on the answer. Um, 
but there's still probability that we're wrong because there's a lot of error and stuff. So I think there, you need to perform more calculations to get the mm. the correct answer. But okay, um, yeah, it, it it's still it's it's still f- yes it, feels it feels incomplete. Yeah, it definitely <laughs> does, especially the way they explain it. it. Just or my knowledge feels incomplete. I should specifically say. Yeah, I'd I have just, to actually. Yeah, I think unfortunately for Grover's algorithm, I'd have to really actually build the algorithm to understand it. <laughs> Yeah, because every explanation I've checked probably at least six or seven ex- explanations and I don't get it, including the main paper. So yeah, I think I have to um, I'd have to build it. You know what it reminded me of though, um, yeah. which was interesting. I was trying to see if there was see if there was a relation. It immediately reminded me of negative feedback loops, mm-hmm. because negative feedback loops basically work in a way where you have like an op op you have an operational amplifier. Um, And what happens is you have some noisy signal that comes in. Mm -hmm. That noisy signal gets amplified, but then you feed that signal back into the um, voltage in and you subtract off the noise. And you just do this continuously to where you have like this this convergence towards equilibrium. And I was like, oh, maybe there's some relation between negative feedback loops and um, Grover's algorithm that can maybe help me understand. I was hoping that the math would be the same. But unfortunately, I don't think it was. <laughs> so I tried to find it, but I, I was like, it's, there has to be some kind of relation, I feel like. like but I don't saying, know if this is just me like stretching. Like an analog, you're saying. Right? Yeah, because if at least, because I feel like I can understand negative feedback loops easier than Grover's algorithm. But then I was looking and I didn't really see that much convincing me that they had a relation. But perhaps they do, but I didn't discover anything that was simple enough for me to spot. Um so, of course, if anybody has any relation between negative feedback loops and Grover's algorithm, that would be very helpful as well. Yeah. Yeah, because, uh, I mean, the way IBM put it, I mean, they just put it in the language of vectors. They were like, here's a nice mm. geometrical interpretation. Yeah. And yeah. then they gave, like, well, the the here in theory, here's the state that is select, that, that, that's the one you're looking for. Yeah. And then the superposition state. And then it's like, well, like, you would amplify it's again you would amplify the uh the solution um yeah that's the problematic statement right there because if you don't know the solution how do you amplify the solution yeah and if you know the solution then just find the solution instead of amplifying it (laughs) you see what i mean so i don't really know well the idea is with the quantum systems like i know that it's there's a lot of error and and um and it's hard to get a clear uh, result because of it's still probability based in a lot of ways. Okay, but, um, but what are you saying? I'm saying like it, it's a it's a correction, like you're saying with the feedback loop situation. It's like if you do one sweep, it's yeah. But that's not really noisy. the issue I'm talking about. The issue is mostly just like what is the marked element? What does that mean? Mm-hmm. You know, because the that's thing is, right. you should have zero knowledge of what the answer is. So we need to really understand, like, how is this algorithm performing? Like, I know it has to go through many iterations, but it, are the all the iterations just with that one marked element, or does the marked element change every iteration? Like, what's happening? Okay, so you want to hear what, uh, so this this website, Quant, it's essentially, it's called Quantiki, it's yeah, yeah. Quantiki. It's yeah, I've seen that many, quant- many times, yeah. Mechanics, yeah. Quantiki.org, they're saying steps of the algorithm. Mm. One, initialize the system to the state S, which is the superposition the state. Superposition yes. state. Yes. It says perform the following quote unquote Grover iteration a number of n times. The function that includes the number of Grover iterations is this is described below. You apply a unitary operator. Um which acts as a subroutine that compares database entries according to some search criterion. Um, the algorithm does not specify how the subroutine works, but it must be a quantum subroutine that works with superposition of states. Um, f- and it must act specially on one of the eigenstates, which corresponds to the entry matching the search criteria. Mm. So, yeah. 
Yeah, I think I read that one already. It didn't help. <laughs> so you apply the operator until it finds, until it finds us the 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 criteria. So that's what it's saying. What criteria? So the search criteria, like I was saying, like for instance, in the example that uh, was given, like the the you're given a phrase and you only know a couple words. Mm -hmm. uh, it's let's say the word is piranha, but you're missing mm -hmm. pi blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. So I guess you go into the database, your Grover iteration, you tell it what the search criterion is, and then mm -hmm. it acts on that um, criteria. And then you run, it says the function run runs n times and is described below. And then you apply the quantum operator, um, which compares the database entries to the search criterion. Um, and it's going to give you the eigenvalues um matching that result mm -hmm. um but the idea is that you want to identify the eigenstate that matches your eigenvalue so that's the operation that you first do so you find the value that matches and then it says you apply the operator like you were saying the unitary operator that gets you back into superposition well that's the Hadamard gate but you need to, but you need to do a phase inversion yeah after whatever you've done the so the first thing you should ever be doing is the um, superposition state, and then you perform the unitary operation mm -hmm. um, for the phase inversion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or, and it, which is the phase inversion, I should say. Sorry. No, you're good. Um, well, the thing is, I'm having a hard time defining U of S, but I'll I'll, I'll take your word on it. Yeah, there should I'll be two U U's. There should be a yeah. U of S and a U of something else. U of W is the one that finds the the match for your criterion. Yeah, that's okay. the um inversion about the mean that's your answer though no that should be another operator an operation uh it gets you to your answer but that is another um gate essentially or an oracle okay gate. well maybe i'm misinterpreting what it's saying because it says it must it says u of w the unitary operator is a thing that searches your criteria and finds Yes. It corresponds to to the database entry matching the search criteria. Yes. It's still an operator, though. Uh, I see. I see. Yeah. It says, our goal is to identify the eigenstate uh, that matches our criterion or equivalently mm -hmm. the eigenvalue. And then you do the U of S operator, which you're saying is a phase inversion operator. Oh, so you're saying you do U of W first? Yeah, that's what it's saying. Oh, here. so that's the phase then. That's what it's saying here. Okay, so then the second one would be the inversion about the mean. Mean the U of S. Yeah. Well, the the but there's a third one. After we apply those two operators, uh -huh. we perform the measurement. We yeah. perform a measurement, and the measurement result will be uh, within some energy with probability approaching one. Yeah, yeah. As you increase the number of trials. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, so from this this uh, arbitrary lambda omega mm -hmm. so it's a scaling factor lambda is a scaling mm -hmm. factor you will get your value omega yeah 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 i'm i might be making this sure, up sure sure <laughs> so put a massive <laughs> asterisk on this but i think i might be making this up but this okay. is the only thing i can think of in my mind right now that make kind of makes it make sense yeah yeah like your unitary operator they call it an oracle or a black box because it just it's like you program that unitary operation to work on whatever the state you're looking for. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking for omega, let's say, then your unitary operator is a specific omega operator. If you're looking for a state rho, then it will be a u of rho or something. I don't know if it's adding confusion, but it's like your unitary yeah. operator already knows what you're looking for. Yeah. And since you can apply that unitary operation at once to all of the states in your eigenstate, it only inverts whatever matches for the u of omega i see you see what i mean yeah yeah, yeah. how that works sure. i don't know but it's a quantum is that, thing, is that right? why they call it an oracle because it knows maybe well i don't know i don't know if it's a gen i think I like, it's a generic like term things. yeah i think I it's already in a generic term to spite the algorithms like, i think yeah. they use it in all kinds of computer science stuff but maybe yeah. i don't know I'm, maybe I, i'm wrong i hope they do actually use it that way where it's like <laughs> it just knows man it's yeah, I think it is related. It's quantum. Though. I it don't have to related. explain shit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's related for sure, but um, maybe not to specific, specifically Grover's algorithm. But right. yeah, I think that's the key is like somehow the Oracle has the information encoded into it to find Omega yeah. already. 
So then all the other states are unaffected. So it just does the phase inversion. And then it's just a matter of the system. Since the system is quantum, we can exploit yeah. those quantum effects where you're acting all these states and you just keep doing the, you know, the phase inversion plus the, um, you know, the uh, aversion about the mean to where the mm -hmm. signal gets amplified to where the chosen state or the marked state mm -hmm. now is amplified completely to a, you know, a 50% probability where every other state is like, you know, right. a very low probability. So, you know, with 50% confidence, which is high confidence that that is your answer. Yeah. And yeah. you just do that a number of square root of, square n, root times. of n times. Yeah, exactly. So I think we might have figured it out. That, I mean, if that actually is right. Well, I don't know if well, that's true. Well, we can though. corroborate this with, uh, I guess, to close the, the, the topic here, I'll give the closing thoughts about what IBM said to yeah. see if it aligns with our with our uh, our Eureka moments. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, let's do it. So it says, two, uh, two reflections always correspond to, oh, sorry, I'll skip that. It says, the transformation... U, of a, U sub S and U, I guess, omega, rotates the initial state, the superposition state, closer towards the uh, omega state or the, the state that we're looking for. Yeah. It says the action of the reflection in the amplitude can be understood as a reflection. It, it's the, I guess, the inversion about the sure. average amplitude. Since the average amplitude has been lowered by the first inversion, this transformation boosts the negative amplitude of the 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 state that we're looking for yeah. that has the answer yeah to roughly three times its original value right that makes sense while it decreases the other amplitudes yeah we then go to step two to repeat the application this procedure will be repeated several times to focus in on the state that will that eigenstate there that has the solution right yeah so after t number of steps the state will have transformed to um, since it's a unitary operation, you, you get back to the superposition state. Um, but how many times do we need to apply this rotation? It turns out roughly square root of n times. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. square root of n times rotation. So since we were saying... Right, if you're, we, if you're mapping it in the phase space. Right. Right, because you can do multiple mappings. You can, yeah. you can look at the... I don't think we got to a video where there was a phase space operation, but it's no. like there's a winning state or whatever you call exactly, it. Exactly. And then yeah. there's the, um, whatever the starting state, yeah. the superposition state is a starting state. So there's two axes mm -hmm. and you can look at the phase between those. And then eventually you'll get to the winning state. It might add a confusion. So if you don't understand what that means, just don't worry. Just look at the it. video. I'll put, I'll put yeah. the second video on here, but, uh, yeah, since we're dealing with amplitudes and not probabilities, the vector space dimensions enters at, enters as a square root, whatever, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. Um, so, yeah, so that's why the amplitudes uh, increase and not decrease. So would you say that's kind of – we got the crux of it? I think I understand it. Yeah. It's just the key is understanding that the quantum part is the real mess up, which is always the case, right? It's the, it's the real unlock is mm -hmm. this weird unitary operator somehow acts on all of these states at one time. Yeah. And because of that, you can tune that operator to specifically act on whatever you're looking for. Because there is some unique state that you want to find, right? You exactly, already know yeah. what you want to find. Exactly, yeah. So you just, you have the operator that can magically find already found, find the match, right? And since yeah. it can act on all these states at one time, it already knows the match. You don't know the match necessarily, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but it knows the match because it has all the states in a superposition. And that's really the powerful part about quantum mechanics is that all these states, you know, all these states can be, operated on at one time right exactly yeah and then it's just a matter of bringing it into the into reality by doing all these little fancy tricks of phase inversions and inversions about the mean mm -hmm. so that we can actually find the state you know so mm -hmm. it's like it's boosting this weight the weights as we said earlier or the probability of that particular state we're looking for so that mm -hmm. humans can actually we can actually see okay you know once we've done enough measurements that's how we can get actual probabilities with a consistent answer, right? So that yeah. we can find that answer. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I think we figured it out. Maybe. Hey, if it's it. wrong, though, leave a comment. Cause, if you know, it's we, wrong, we IBM, can... somebody come on from IBM. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's an open invitation. <laughs> but, yeah, see, this is like this is actually an interesting podcast because this is the first time, I think, where we've actually shown people like how we think through problems, <laughs> which is even worse, though, because we have no math. So yeah. usually when me and Juan solve problems like this, We'll then go to the next the step math. of actually doing the math, or yeah. we we usually be doing the math already, but you know we like to think of it and approach it from three, two or three different angles. So mm. 
we really have to convince ourselves. So right now, this is the first iteration of I think I might have found the answer, and I feel okay yeah. about it, but yeah. I don't really know until I've actually stepped through the mathematics. And then probably in the next attack angle of attack will be to actually program a Grover's yeah. algorithm and then run it multiple times to see if it actually works. Yeah. So this is almost like a, a little crash course in the way of how you actually do and solve physics problems in some way. Yeah, that's true. Speaking of computation stuff, yeah, we had a we had a podcast we did with uh, someone that kind of had a quantum game. Yeah, Daniel. Yeah, Dan. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The name the name of the program is. Uh, do you still remember? Quantum that? Odyssey. Quantum Odyssey. Yeah. Yeah. Go check that out if you haven't already. They they actually provide some intuition on the quantum logic gates and stuff the quantum gates that are used and right it's kind of a fun way to get you used to like using the um different unitary operations yeah, in quantum yeah. mechanics mm -hmm. although i don't know how much intuition it will give you but it will at least give you some quantum intuition to how like states are being manipulated exactly, if you're actually yeah. trying to do it in a um you know like in a intuitive uh, way no, if you're actually like trying to follow along, oh, so you can I just see. throw you can just throw the operators on there, and it will maybe work. But if you're actually trying to understand it, the logic, then it, yeah, yeah, then you can. It it could be a useful tool. I wish I had it when I was you know in undergraduate because yeah, I would be playing that game all the time probably and not doing homework. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean they they you can you can use a I, I believe in the game. There's different algorithms you can make that are super long. Yeah. And it's yeah. and it gets more challenging as you progress. Yeah, and uh, but go check that out. I think in in yeah, I posted the link um to our podcast mm -hmm. on the uh, community page. Yeah. Our our audio was kind of fucked up though during that podcast, oh, really? so I don't know if it's a oh cause, super uh, watchable. Yeah, we did it over uh over live stream. Live stream. Yeah, on YouTube. And our you upload know rates are, our upload rates are really bad yeah. where we are, but <laughs> um, but in case you didn't really get all that, there's also IBM's Quantum Composer website mm. where they you can build your own quantum gates and put putting stuff into superposition and right. even using grover's algorithm here oh nice yeah it's cool maybe we'll mess around maybe we'll do an episode on that we gotta get Just some better gear for that try, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> call up uh whoever comcast and be like hey uh upgrade right. our, our internet speeds <laughs> but yeah i think that solves anyway. it i i think uh with a two minute no with uh what is it What's our time at? The Grover's Algorithm Lecture. We we were able to do it. We're about an hour and a half here. Okay. Dang, that's a yeah. long-ass podcast. Yeah, was, <laughs> but that went by kind of fast, surprisingly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, don't forget to uh, like, share, comment, subscribe. Mm -hmm. And uh, check out the website, eigenbros.com, eigenbros on Twitter, eigenbros on Instagram, eigenbros2 on TikTok. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, Patreon, guys. Uh, yes. Thank you once again, patrons. We appreciate it, guys. Uh, you know, you really help us out here. And maybe we can even do some more cooler things in the future. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, if you want to become a patron, just patreon.com slash eigenbros. And we do yes. a 30-minute podcast every week there on random crap. So yeah. join up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and let us know what you thought of this more free-form episode. Um, yeah, it's a new experiment. Me and Juan are trying to go with more hangout discussion format. Yeah. Rather than like two guys trying to lecture the audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> turning it into a, uh, us. Yeah, us literally just sitting here and feeding spoon feeding you information right because i've always been insecure about trying to figure things out on the podcast yeah i feel like you know sometimes i can be unlistenable especially with me and you because sometimes we tend to just think <laughs> yeah you know not say much not say anything yeah which can be annoying but yeah, maybe some sure. skill in trying to practice actually still talking for and sure. thinking for sure i don't know let us know what you think let us know what you i think, don't like folks. to just sit and just stare into space <laughs> it's not very just, interesting uh, yeah lectures I, me and Terrence were not a fan of lectures. We'll tell you that. Yeah, I'm not really. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I do go to them on YouTube sometimes because I can just yeah. zoom to a part that I like. That's true. Well, but watching whole one through, and yeah. real life lectures too were just so painful to sit in. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, podcasts are supposed to be fun because it's like you know you're hanging out with your buddies. Yeah. And this podcast is also not supposed to feel like work. It's supposed to be like just giving you ideas and thinking yeah. about things, maybe learning some new things yeah, and concepts sure. you wouldn't know about. Yeah. Yeah. So hopefully this, you know, hopefully we're evolving in the platform and not, you know, going backwards. Yeah. True. Well, let us know what you think, and uh, please, if you haven't already, become a patron or follow us on our socials, and uh, or don't, or don't, you know. But yeah, if you like don't. us, you know. Yeah. Go ahead. You know, give us a, give it. us a like. 
and share us with your friends on all the Facebook meme pages that are out right. there. <laughs> um, anything helps, guys. Anything helps. But yeah, and I think that's it. All right, yeah, folks. We'll see you next Ta-ta. week. Ta-ta.